I mean, over that period of time, I guess it, it seemed like there was a lot of development in social networks, and eventually, I don't know, you know, sort of what the experience was, but MySpace and Orchid, and then later also Facebook, uh, had a lot of growth. And I don't know exactly when you sort of started to look at the playbook again and begin developing ideas for Zynga, but uh, you certainly had an early perspective on social networks and some other businesses. How did any of that sort of you know affect your thinking about like what did I what would I want to do with Zynga and once Facebook sure. launched? So, so I'd say uh, I I wandered in the wilderness for a while, maybe uh, two years. I took Tribe back over, which was stupid. Um, never do that. Um, <laughs> never, never take back over a previous company. Yeah, don't ever like let them let them die. Don't <laughs> don't ever live so, that. So wait a second. I know Garrett Camp is retaking uh, Stumble Upon and some guys who started Skype are trying that. You're I'd those say are waste of time. I mean, Skype's obviously in a very different place, and that's an existing franchise, so I can't say that's a waste of time. But but if you have a venture that didn't make it, let it die. Like just don't try to prove anything, just let it go. Um, so I uh, I came back I, I the one insight I'd realized doing Tribe was that we <coughs> built a plugin architecture for Tribe, kind of an early precursor of these APIs because we thought that we would be in this arms race with social networks to offer all these, you know, pictures and video and all these things that we could never build. So, so we built this plugin architecture. I was much more interested in being a plugin than being the container. I thought that the, at the time, all that we had to do to keep Tribe going was just you did, just did all this work on plumbing and stopping pornography and community fighting and all this stuff. And and if I could have catapulted all that, like we can today, you know, I, I would have. Um, in fact, so, so wait a second, are what you're saying is it's better to be Zynga than Facebook? No, because I wasn't <laughs> Facebook. It's better to be Facebook than Tribe. Um, <laughs> okay, we'll quote you on that one. <laughs> but, uh, so, so you roll the camera forward, so uh, it was sometime in January, February of 07, uh, when the Facebook people, I think it was Matt Kohler, told me that they were going to open up their API, and I just thought, that's awesome. I mean, and I had spent a couple of years trying to find some way to bring services to a large audience. I actually had spent almost a year trying to buy CNET. I mean, I, I got all these uh, bankers and equity guys together, and I made three approaches to the board of CNET who had no interest. Uh, we, we offered. Twelve fifty a share, no interest. They would rather sell eventually for eleven. You know, um, thank God for me that I didn't win that. Um, but but then when they opened up uh, Facebook, I just thought, shit. You know, you don't have to spend one point eight billion to buy a CNET to get an audience. You could just show up on on Facebook. So uh, so I and I immediately started working on games because. The whole time I was doing Tribe, I wanted to do games. I just thought the coolest thing, once you get everyone together, was to offer them games. And were you picking that up from other things that were going on? Were you looking at any like companies like QQ in China or anything that was happening in the gaming environment in Korea at that time? Or you just like recognized that games were going to be an interesting platform themselves? I, I really just came at it from a user perspective that I just thought, I just thought that the most interesting thing I could offer on a social network was games. So I, I didn't think at all about the virtual goods model or Asia. I vaguely knew about it. Um, but I mean, I, I know I've had a conversation with Dave Morin, uh, and you and I had this conversation where he sort of famously like said, gee, I wish you were working on something more serious than games on Facebook platform. And that was a pretty early conversation. Right? Yeah, Dave Morin and I uh, got together Sorry, Dave Morin's uh, one of the platform guys at Facebook for people who aren't familiar with him. Yeah, so, so he and I got together for a coffee um, in like April of 07, and I told him I was really excited and I was going to do this poker game to be the only live game when they launched. And, and he definitely felt sorry for me. And, <laughs> and he said, Mark, come on, there's so many viral things you can do. Why do you want to bother with games? I got to tell you, we have no one asking us for games, you know. There's just 
a million things and, and why don't you go look at graffiti and wall and all these things that you know that are easy opportunities or obvious buyers. Because those are such great productivity apps that consumers are screaming for. Well games aren't productivity apps either. But he, it was more that he just thought, hey there's low hanging fruit and, and it wasn't obvious the games would be viral. I mean and they weren't to start with. But I mean, sometime after platform launch, and definitely you know the last year, but I think maybe even more than a year ago, I think people started to understand that casual games or social games, depending on like, how you call them, you know, had legs or had interest, and people in both PC community and in the Facebook universe realized that there was something there. Right? And you guys have obviously capitalized that, uh, capitalized on that. And, you know, although there are other companies out there, certainly Slide, Rocky, Zynga, uh, excuse me, uh, Playfish, and SGN are going after it. Uh, you guys have got a lot of attention uh, for your efforts and progress recently. Um, so I guess, you know, what really was, uh, what helped you guys crack the nut on that? What was the components of your success that you think really made a difference over the last you know, year or so? Well, number one was focus. So we knew from the beginning that we wanted to do games. And we knew we wanted to do social games, and we knew we wanted to do social games on Facebook and any other place that they could live, and no place they couldn't live. So, so focus was big, because there were a lot of game companies that came in early. There was, there was poker companies that offered their poker games before we did. Um, there was EA, and, and a lot of casual game companies came out with games, but they viewed the social networks as a channel. So, so we had an advantage over them. We shouldn't have, but we did because they didn't take it as take the medium as some serious platform unto itself. And then uh, I think because we were there earlier, we made a lot of mistakes earlier, and we learned a lot of lessons sooner than others. Um, and I think over the last two years, we've uh, built a lot of great processes and gone through a lot of a lot of growing pains. And when you say growing pains, that's we're not just talking about product, but you guys have actually, I, I think, over a couple hundred employees now. How many? How many employees? Uh, I think we're like maybe uh, 310 full time, and um, we've recently outsourced most of our customer support. So maybe with contractors, we might be like 350 or 360, and with, I mean, if you add, probably another 180 in customer support. And, and the first year, I'm assuming, wasn't the majority of that growth. It's really been the last year that's been all that, a lot of that growth. Is that correct? Well, oh, people, yeah, we were. Um, so a year ago, how many people were you? Uh, in, we were probably like 60 people by this point last year. Um, so that, yeah. that's really quite astonishing, right? Like four or five hundred percent growth in one year. Yeah, it's uh -huh. it's been uh, it's been a. A big year, and I, and I know you know. I'll take a little bit of divergence here. Diversion. Uh, I know you're a big fan of sort of building company culture, but you know, you know, adding 250 people or close to it in a year, uh, you know, obviously being able to put any amount of culture stamp on the organization is a big challenge. Um, yeah, it's it's. I found, and this has been such an amazing learning experience for me, because uh, even with support, I was CEO up to maybe 200 people. But it happened much slower, and I think once you hit, you can, I find up to about 50 or 60 people, you can manage your company yourself as CEO. Like you can kind of touch everyone. Like up to like 50 people, we had a phone call every morning for half an hour, and I had everyone in the company on the phone, and we would go through the priorities for the day. And then we had a call with about 15 people every Sunday night, and we'd go through the priorities for the week. And beyond 50 people, we tried it, but the call the call didn't work at 50 people. It was kind of ridiculous. Uh, and then at about then you so you have to start uh, delegating to people beyond 50, and like really delegating, like you don't know what they're doing that week per se exactly. And then beyond 200 people, things start to really break. I mean, we experienced a lot of breakage, and we lost some people, and we laid off some people. 200 seemed to be a point where you start like questioning your culture and who you are and you have to start thinking of things you didn't care about like you need an HR department and you need a mission statement and 
Yeah. And so this isn't like theoretical, like this stuff has happened in the last six months and yeah. it's going at light speed for you guys, right? Yeah, but, it, but the, the good news, um, and I'm sure and there's a lot of people from Facebook here, and I'm curious if they've, how they've gone through big, much bigger transitions, but we found uh, by December we started to really embrace process, like really, really embrace it, and the company fought it. I mean, like the omen, like heads spinning around, <laughs> fire breathing. I mean, people said, you're, you're going to ruin us. We used to be a startup. You want to make us corporate. Now we're going to be a slow, big company. And by the way, we did get slower when we instituted processes. So in the beginning, it proved those people right. But, but we played through that. We stuck to it. And, and now we wouldn't be surviving without it. So uh, things like we manage our company off something called OKRs. I don't know if this is interesting or boring. Uh, objectives and key results, which is how Intel manages and Google manages their engineering organization. So we do that, and we do weekly roadmaps, and we have mission and values and stuff like that. It's all uh, a way to keep everyone aligned and keep people that you may not talk to in a month working on things that are important to the organization. And the biggest problem we have is like, you hit these points, especially around 200 people, where you're really frustrated because you're getting beaten by companies that are four people. And you're like, how are we 200 people and there's a four person company, there's some of them are in the room. Um, there's a four person company that is executing much better and faster than us. And it really is painful. And, and it's, it's about finding ways to keep all of your best resources aligned with your best opportunities. And, it's just, it's just been, uh, it was a lot of thrashing, but we're at this, we're, I'm happy to say that we're at this point now where um, I think we have scaling in place that we could double in size without falling over. Um, so I guess I know you guys have raised a fair amount of capital north of 40 million or maybe something right now? Uh, 39. 30. Okay, sorry, I was on. Um, but I know that also, like, your growth isn't necessarily fueled by $40 million in capital, that you guys are actually making a fair amount of money on the growth that you have, which is, you know, also quite tremendous. Um, so there's this, you know, proof point, I think, around social games, at least driving growth of the organization that I think you guys and many others have succeeded on. But somewhere along the line, you also tackled some type of monetization that appears to be uh, successful. And although I'm not sure if you're ready to disclose numbers, I've heard uh, 50 to 100 million in revenue is some of the numbers that you guys might be pulling down right now and people rumoring IPOs. Uh, and feel free to jump in and correct me on any of those numbers if you want. I, I hate to piss off Eric Eldon because I promised him all exclusives. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> Well, you'll be at his table uh, so that you can share all those more uh, discreetly with him. Um, but I guess, you know, at least at a high level, what would you say is driving some of your monetization? And in particular, I want to talk about a very, very brief, like one paragraph post you made on your personal blog a couple of uh, weeks ago that talked about sort of game mechanics and monetization and social commerce. But, um, so oh, yeah. Well, that, that's actually a topic I'd love to talk to the broader group Absolutely. about. Um, but, but first, so monetization, what do you think is, you know, is, is virtual currency or some type of monetization really driving your success, or what's the story? Sure. So, so the, the two lessons or two uh, insights that, that hit me right away in the beginning, one was with Tribe, we suffered from over-engagement, which if you're in the web ad business is bad, right? It, it always bothered me that if you were the CEO of iVillage, you had all these people coming to your site and spending all this time, all these women who were like really, really, really engaged, and you were making no money. You couldn't sell an ad to save your life. But then they'd click away to eBay, Google, make one 100 billion, 140 billion, and click back and spend the rest of their day with you, right? So you were kind of hosting people for Google and eBay. And, and Tribe was similar. And it, I was always so frustrated because we were trying to figure the worst insight of Tribe was the people who found Tribe by accident through Google SEO were the ones who made all the revenues of Tribe. And the users who were there all the time just cost us money. So when I got into games on social networks, 
I really wanted a monetization that was aligned with engagement, where the more engagement meant, meant more revenues. And I also really wanted the company, if possible, to be uh, profitable, cash flow positive from the beginning, because I'm sure another cliche that we all know is, I, I like to say you need to uh, protect investors from themselves. So I think that most companies will be worth more if you control them and not your investors. And in fact, I think they're worth more if you control them and they're not independently controlled. So I think, you know, like a movie, there should be one director and one voice surrounded by brilliant people that make you, you know, smarter. But um, so, so that was really important from the beginning. So we, so we started testing monetization ideas right away and we took the, the second insight was, so first is have a business model where you make more money the more they stay, not the more they leave. The second was, um, uh, brain freeze. Uh, <laughs> wait. Uh, these are my two founding insights. I gotta remember. <laughs> oh, shit. Okay, I got it. I got it. Okay. Uh, How much sleep did you get last night? Really? <laughs> I actually got sleep last night too. Uh, so the, the second insight was I had gotten addicted to this game Rise of Nations to, to the point that it ruined the relationship. I just was such an idiot. I just would, I didn't even find cheats. I just sat there and, and tried to get better and better at the game and I'm sure they all had cheats. And I would have paid, I, it hit me, I was like, I would pay, I would pay thousands of dollars. I would pay five, ten grand just to be able to beat these kids and be done with this fucking game. And that was my insight. I was like, there's probably people like me out there that have this latent game addiction but don't have time for it, and they would pay money because they realize that time is worth money. satisfy all the audience people who pay to level up, right? Yeah, pay to level up. So, you know, they talk about virtual goods that don't impact the game at all. Ours impact the game. Um, so. So, so those those are the two insights. Now, since then, I, I did put a post up on my blog, which was like 20 minutes while I was waiting for my wife, and so it wasn't very well thought out or crafted. But, but I think this is what you're referring to. The the point that I would be great to share with you guys, and is interesting for discussion, is I believe that we are at the beginning of this third business plan of the internet that. That it is, I believe that that it's all about user pay, and it's all about user pay for digital only goods and services. And I don't mean games, and I don't mean virtual goods the way you think about them. I mean this could be buying an O'Reilly report. I mean this could be um, buying a 500 hats report. Um, but I think that that in the next like five, ten years that the ad model is gonna become less and less of a driver of consumer internet services, and the direct user pay is going to be the big horse that everyone's going to ride. And, and there's so many amazing skill sets that we've all built over the last 10 years that we're gonna to bring to bear on this. And the, a lot of infrastructure that's coming to place. It's yeah, to the, the ability to be uh, data driven and to do rapid A B testing and flow testing and to turn knobs that drive reach, retention, and revenue, and, and the amount that we'll be able to instrument our businesses will be unlike any business that the world's ever seen. And, and also, games, I, and this is how myopic I am that I see the whole world just through my lens, but take it for what it's worth. I believe that games and game mechanics are going to be a, a central driving force in all consumer services. I don't think it's just games. I think that my wife, just one example, it's not a shameless plug. My <laughs> wife has a new uh, business called onekingslane.com um, slash join. Um, and she um, also has no VC funding. Um, <laughs> I, I started with no VC funding. Uh, and she's profitable. And, and it's a, uh, a membership, a private sale business like Guilt Group for home decor items. But what's been fun for us is we've been applying game mechanics, like I do in my games, to her business. So she has limited edition items. 
And she's gonna have rare items, and she has time windows, and she can use those to drive virality and day-over-day -day retention. So, I mean, I, I think this is fascinating, and I, I did wanna ask you a lot about this. So we, we had uh, Amy Jo Kim come and talk to our group uh, in January about game mechanics. We didn't necessarily talk about that concept applied to commerce, but uh, I certainly think there's a lot of interesting things happening around what might be called viral commerce or social commerce, and it sounds like you're sort of like tapping into that from sort of the game area, but like looking at it where it's not just games. And like there's a lot of fascinating things going on there, right? So gift cards and frequent flyer programs are maybe like the closest things we have right now to games apply to offline businesses. And I think what I hear you saying is basically that set of mechanics can be enhanced and provided to a lot of what we consider to be offline businesses right now, but a lot of those are moving online. Oh, it could be apply to online businesses. I don't know or really care about offline. I mean, online, I mean, online is, it, it's, the, the opportunities ahead for existing and new businesses are just, it's more than I've ever seen in my entire career. So, and anything, if, if, if you're at Facebook, you can apply the same game mechanics and the same kind of metrics that we apply to reactivate users and bring them back. And Facebook really is a game for a lot of people. Uh, if you were running Amazon, um, th there's so many things that, I, the good, I, I think it's at a macro level, we kind of, were, we've all been so busy building out businesses that we've forgotten about adding fun to all of this. And I think there's like this macro opportunity to make everything for the consumer be you know, 10 times more fun. But, but